Christian Network. I'm Brian O'Brien. With me today once more is my co-host, Lisa Joseph. And we will replace our special segment this morning when we look at some of the major stories that we brought you over the last week. And as you know, certainly one of the major events over the past week was the advent of Tropical Storm Doria. that, pa Doria that oh, passed yeah. through. Actually, we saw that that gave us a glance. Us. Yes, <laughs> and we have with us the acting director of the National Emergency Management Organization, Nemo, the story in Gustav. Ms. Gustav, welcome to In Focus. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Well, I think this is actually your, your, your first sojourn actually in, into the role and to actively get involved with an event like this, the, the tropical storm passing. And maybe you would first of all like to tell us a bit more on the, the real roles, NEMO and NEMAC, as maybe solutions would get greater clarity as to the functions of these two organizations. Certainly. So NEMO, um, we look at NEMO, the secretariat, mm -hmm. which is the administrative arm of NEMO that is located at BZ in Castries. Uh, it is staffed by a director, deputy director, um, training officer, a communications manager, a secretary, administrative secretary, a driver, and also we have a telecoms person who is on contract. Um, this is basically the administrative arm of NEMO. However, NIMU, the broader organization, is uh, made up of a number of other agencies, such as um, the Met Office, GIS, of course, um, Ministry of Education, all PSs um, are part of this organization, Ministry of Equity, um, the critical infrastructure, Agencies such as Lucilec, Wasco, Flow, Digicel, Chamber of Commerce, SLHTA, and the list goes on. All of those form NIMU. So when you hear NIMU, it is not the secretariat when, the when it comes to an activation for a an event, a hazard that is approaching, and so on. Okay, well, with that definition, maybe you can look at some of the standard op operating procedures of NEMO. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of concepts that came into greater focus. Well, it has been around for some time, but yes. at this point in time, maybe it's a good opportunity to tell us a bit about the shutdown mm -hmm. as a definition and subsequently to that and all clear. Okay, so um, the shutdown is outlined in our standard operating procedure, volume four, where um, the NIMAC, which is the National Emergency Management Advisory Committee that the Prime Minister heads meet for a pre-strike meeting. At this meeting, we will, on the advice of the MET service, MET um, office, the Prime Minister and the body will determine a time that is more suitable. And this is because it is intended that lives are preserved. NIMO is all about security, and safety of the nation. So at this meeting, based on the severity and the, how close the event is, the hazard is, then a determination is made. And in the last instance, you saw that um, the six o'clock was the shutdown time for the country. Shutdown means that all services, every uh, business house, every service place, comes to an end. No one is expected to be out there. And that includes hotel workers, um, supermarket workers, um, anywhere that you work. You, that is supposed to come to an end. But then I think too that for the public, you know, how that way it gets a little um, uh, confusing, mur yes. murky, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think that has been for a number of years now. Yes, it has. Because you mentioned the hotel workers, mm -hmm. but you have uh, sectors where continuous service is mm -hmm. expected. So for like a, a hotel, for example, uh, the guest, they need to be served. That's right. Uh, the hotel must be up and functioning. Somebody has to see over the well-being of the guest. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is the understanding between the hotel sector 
and NEMO, NEMAC, or the, the understanding of how these things function? Is it that the workers who are there ought to up and leave? Or is there a policy or that is activated that maintains service at the same time keeping the workers safe? Okay. Um, the hotel um, sector through SLHT, uh, they, there is an understanding that their um, emergency plan kicks into place, come into place when an, a shutdown is given or an impending hazard. So the hotel is supposed to ensure that when there is a hazard and a shutdown has been given, their plans will determine how they operate from there. So the onus is on the hotel to determine how the staff movement mm -hmm. takes place. So um, they determine if the staff that are there are supposed to remain until the all clear has been given. So that is what is in place for a hotel. So uh, we heard persons call during the storm and say that I'm on my way to, the, um, to work. I work at the hotel. I'm supposed to show up. And um, we don't support that at all. So we're asking the hotels to ensure that your emergency plans are in place in the event of such hazards. What is the level of discussion? For example, the pre-strike meeting. Mm -hmm. Some of the, you mentioned WASCO, Lucilic and so forth, forming yes. part of that broad umbrella of NEMO. Mm -hmm. The private sector, where does it fall in the mix of things and what is the level of consultation with the private sector uh, at a pre-strike meeting? Okay, so the private sector is represented um, through the Chamber of Commerce and they were there at the pre-strike meeting. Um, there were a number of points clarified at this point. Um, what it, does it mean, a six o'clock shutdown mean? And the onus now is on the business places to determine if the shutdown is at six o'clock, what time do I close my business to allow my staff enough time, those who have to take the bus, to get to the bus and to get out of the area where they are to get to home. So all of these things must be determined by the business places um, once the shutdown time has been given. So for instance, um, yesterday, the BVI was under threat. The pre-strike meeting took place at 11 o'clock. The shutdown was at 2.30. That does not leave much time, but that is the shutdown time. And persons have to ensure that they get out of harm's way. And that is to preserve lives, not just because we want to pull it out there and just say, it's, we shut down at 6 o'clock. A lot of things are taken into consideration when a time is given for 6 o'clock. The BVI was not expecting the storm to come their way yeah, because of the trajectory. They were not it at all. Right. So mm -hmm. it turned and they had to move. And there are instances when we have to do th um, the same, you know. But the six o'clock time that we gave, it was based on the prediction of the med services. Okay. So I, I just wanted to ask mm -hmm. a, a follow up to that. Does it mean that everyone should be cleared out of the streets? So we should have a virtual ghost town at six o'clock? That is exactly what it means. Everyone should be cleared out. And if that doesn't happen, what happens? You put the emer emergency workers' lives at risk. If the impact is severe, but and it's you at are six. There. You, if you say the shutdown is mm -hmm. at six, mm -hmm. you can't expect people to be off the streets at six. The shut, they have to be off the street, off the streets at six. It doesn't the seem logical, though. No, the shutdown is at six. Six p.m. You have to be off the streets at six p.m. That's what it means. It's not to belabor the point, mm -hmm. but I think for the. Because the public wants a better understanding mm -hmm. of what do I do? Mm -hmm. You had business places that decided, well, shutdown is at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. We shut in our doors at 5.30. Does that leave the staff enough time to get home? It does not leave the staff enough time. For so them to all of home. that must be taken into consideration. How much time do I need to give my staff to get home, to get, get off the streets? You are not supposed to be on the streets at 6 o'clock. We still having some issues as well with the shutdown 
and they all clear mm -hmm. when term persons seem to venture out. Okay. Okay. How now is it all clear determined? I know there's certainly most of the interaction with all the parties first of all to determine the shutdown and the all clear time. Tell us mm -hmm. about that and how it has actually arrived at. Okay. Uh, the again, the Met Office will instruct us of when we are no longer under the threat of the storm or the hazard. Um, this information comes to the to NEMO. The CAPSEC has, has been part of the head of NEMO. It gets that information along with the director of NEMO. When this information reaches us, there are a number of things that have to happen in order for us to give the all clear. Uh, at this point, our first responders will be called to go out there. They have to go ensure that the conditions are safe for the residents to be out there. Um, ensure that the, there are no down power lines, that the roads are passable, there are nothing that is prohibiting persons from traversing and getting to, from one point to the next. When we get the report from our first responder that everything is in place and there is n they are not putting the public in harm's way, then uh, we will give an all clear so that persons can go out there. In terms of communication, actually, during the event mm -hmm. of a storm or hurricane or any other natural disaster, your organization and, well, to a lesser extent, NEMAC, but NEMO, when mm -hmm. it's in full operation during a disaster, yes. there are certain areas of communication that the public sometimes expect. Yes. And there were certain concerns about what that level of communication was mm -hmm. and how your communication processes would have been activated during the event. Could you tell us what are the formalities and mm -hmm. what um, solutions can actually look forward to and what would the main sources be? Okay, so uh, once the shutdown has uh, taken place, the National Emerge Emergency Management, um, sorry, the, the NEOC, which is the National Emergency Operations Operation Center, Center, is activated. At this point, we are at NEMO's headquarters, which is where the center is, and information is shared as they become available. When you get an update from the Met Office, that is NEMO. So to say that you're not getting information from NEMO, it's wrong, because the Met Office is part of NEMO, right? When you get um, information uh, so the information gets from the National Hurricane Center in the U.S., which is where we get our information from, to the Met Office. The Met Office uh, now info informs NEMO, um, the NEOC at this point, and the information is put out there through GIS. GIS, as like I um, indicated, is part of NEMO. So NEMO, um, GIS would update um, the, our page, our Facebook page with information. We also use the CAP.CAP app, which is um, given an alert at, 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 as it becomes available. Um, our website also, we try our best to update as the information becomes av available. Also, we at, at the NEOC, we are in touch with regional international agencies who would want updates and so on. So a lot is going on when we are at the NUC. So it is not like um, we're just sitting there and waiting for updates. So whilst we wait, a lot is happening. We work all night sometimes, nonstop. So that is why we have a shift system, a 12 hour shift system. And sometimes depending on the severity of the storm, or the hazard, we cannot um, get uh, the next group to come in. So you continue. So a lot is going on. And as the information becomes available, and when the need to, for the director to put out, an inf put out information, we do. So 
we put out all of the information that the public is getting is actually coming, coming from, from Nemo. The Nemo. And mm -hmm. just to expand on that, because mm -hmm. a lot of people calling for and wondering why mm -hmm. uh, NTN, for example, mm -hmm. wasn't on air, wasn't giving out the information. GIS slash NTN mm -hmm. uh, is stationed right there. At so Nemo. we had a crew That's from right. the 6 p.m. Mm -hmm right through mm -hmm. to next morning with another crew to relieve that's right but in addition it's not just about uh the the communications aspect goes beyond mm -hmm. just posting on the websites and so forth because um the information is sent i know from the gis crew mm -hmm. we now email all of the media houses it used to be a situation and i could speak to that most and i'm sure ryan can bear me out on yes. this in the private media of where I'm from, and I spent like 20 years there, mm -hmm. over time, once the private media built its capacity, you found that the role that the GIS was playing became more minimalized because then the media houses wanted to take over mm -hmm. and to show their chops, if you will. Okay. So mm -hmm. that information is simply being sent to the media houses via the email. There's a, a platform that the GIS uses that all media houses can mm -hmm. access, where we post um, audio bytes, video bytes, uh, emails go in there, statements go there. Mm -hmm. And it is now for the radio stations and the to TV access. stations to access that platform. That's right. mm -hmm. And they have their own presenters mm -hmm. to give that information. So it used to be a case where you would find perhaps the, the crew stationed there, the information person stationed, before the advent of all of the internet and so forth, they would physically call the radio station mm -hmm. and give out the information. But as I said, the media houses now, because now they're more competitive, everybody wants to show what they can do and so for their own ratings and so forth. And so you simply now become the facilitator of the information and we are no longer the presenters of that information so maybe now and i did hear the prime minister say that you know, they're going to revisit that that's right that perhaps now mm -hmm. the ntn should step in and, and be more than just a facilitator we should now actually present that information i guess that's what the public is asking for where I is ntn uh, but ntn yeah, so is there exactly they do and not so understand it may be silent yes. but we are the ones facilitating all of that information that's right so for example when you had um the tv station on and i want to say kudos to jade brown mm -hmm. and um yadi for a wonderful job over at mbc uh, mbc it but all of that information that they were feeding quite apart from the telephone calls from residents came from the gis and the nemo that's right so we it it is a uh, it's it's a situation where we're not fighting mm -hmm. with each other and the gis understands its role and for the gis as i came to find out once i started working here it does not operate it's like silent. the private mm -hmm. media and so sometimes people get impatient i think i certainly was impatient when i first came to the gis because mm -hmm. i'm from a it's a whole different kettle of fish but the GIS operates under particular rules that private media doesn't have to operate under. I believe, too, um, the sensitization of the public is important. Help them understand the system, how it works. And I think today we are yeah. doing our best to do that. Yes, yes. It's a change to understand it's a change the new system. And, um, and if they have that information, then you, 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 they will understand that the information that they are receiving is actually from NIMO through GIS. You know, and say and see. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I'm really happy that you're able to clarify that, and mm -hmm. something we were at pains to to ensure that it, this actually came out on this program, mm -hmm. and we could just make it simple by letting persons know that actually the National Television Network is very much submerged within the Government Information That's Service, right. mm -hmm. and it's basically a channel to mm -hmm. which the government gets most of its television um, programming out, and not the typical television station that we know, quote unquote, yeah, yeah, basically. Thing, yeah, yes, we're what just basically thing, a channel. Yeah, what, what I wanted to put out there also is that the GIS is the head of the communications arm of NEMO. So once um, there is the shutdown and we're in, 
emergency mode, we it is activated, right? And um, like we said, all of the information is filtered through GIS to the other stations. Okay, we want to give an opportunity to maybe just get a couple calls and maybe any messages on Facebook. So we invite you, our viewers, you can probably call us. We will get our number on the screen to so make it easier for you. And also you can send us some questions via Facebook for Ms. Doreen Gustav. She's the acting director of NEMO. So certainly a very eventful first outing for you, Ms. Gustav. The Indeed. season is, is very much in the interim, as it says, in a real active period. Yes. We are expecting that it's going to get um, a bit more, more active, active as, yeah, as yeah, goes on normal. the end of August yeah. into early September. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that this last event, if Dorian will be able to really test you as such and see how all your systems are functioning That's and right. how well we did following the last system. Okay. So we did well uh, based on reports from our partners, CDMO, uh, certainly. Um, our reporting to them, post strike and, and pre reporting. Um, we got good commendations from CDMO. We got good commendations from our other partner agencies. So I think our systems were in place and they did work. We want to say to you that the time with Ms. Gustav is limited because we do have coming up next the Minister for Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development. So we are asking that you can call with your questions, your comments right now on this segment dealing with uh, the uh, post uh, Tropical Storm Dorian. That telephone number is 4682162. That's 4682162. We are also taking your comments, questions on Facebook if you want to send that in right now. I wanted to ask about the disaster, the district disaster preparedness committees. Okay. There's, there's some concern that perhaps all are not functioning. And, and that is correct. Uh, what we've done is that we have um, started putting plans in place to meet with all of our district disaster committees as a body. And those that are not active, um, some of them are due for elections. We are putting um, a schedule in place to have those elections and to do the training with our district disaster committees to ensure that they are visible on the ground. That is Let's one of my, you know. One, one of the, your, your, the projects to yes, ensure that happens. But well, let's right. go to the telephone lines. Thank you so much. You're in focus with us. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is Gustav, the moderator. <laughs> uh, I just joined the program. I just want to thank um, Nemo and Nima and all the efforts they are making in order to mitigate um, the effect of the hurricane storms and other disasters, and that each and every one of us as citizens should also do our part to make it more effective. And the question I was going to ask was just exactly what. You commented on the Amrita and told um, Mrs. Gustav concerning the disaster preparedness groups. I was wondering who was responsible for that. I understood that it's a country's um, disaster group is defunct. I was going to what he called to find out. Right. And so I was concerned about that. But I think that's very important for those people in the communities, that they know the people where they live. Yes. And then uh, they will be able to go and see, especially the elderly, the Muslims who do not know what's happening. And we, to so be on them to find out even if or to find them before and after a disaster. And we know how devastating some disasters could be. Yes. So that's why I wanted to say thanks for having this program this morning. Thank you. Thank well, you so much for your you. question. Yeah, but you were going to expand on the disaster preparedness yeah, um, committees. When I first um, took office January 15th this year, um, we're coming from ex um, equity. I understood the role, I, I understand the role of the District Disaster Committee because we work with this dis District Disaster Committee. We actually facilitate the, the election of these committees at equity. And so I understood the role that they play in mitigation, in information sharing in, on, at the community level, which is very critical to uh, the functioning or the efficiency of NIMU. So once you have this uh, district disaster committee in place and functioning, you know that your system is strong. And this is close to my heart in ensuring that all of, this all of the committees are in place and are functioning, um, equipped also 
but it costs. So we are working, um, you know, assiduously to ensure that all of the systems are in place. And we are work throughout the night in contact with our district disaster committees. We have a, face, um, a WhatsApp group that they send the messages to us um, bef during the event, you know, prior to the event, after the event, we got um, updates from them. Let's talk about the shelters for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the procedure there? Sh do people go to shelters before, during, or after? Okay, an so, eventuality. So what we have are secondary sh shelters in St. Lucia. But if there is a need, so Ancillary, for instance, is a low-lying area. The District Disaster Committee contacted NEMO and said that we need to open two shelters, right? And um, we, allow, we ask them to, because there are measures to put in place. We have to ensure that there is a medical personnel, maybe a nurse, and security. And of course, there is food for the persons at the shelter. So these things have to be done at least in advance, or a few hours in advance, so we can put all of this in place so that the shelters can be open, right? So like I said, if there is a need, we allow the shelters to be open uh, before uh, a hazard. Yeah. But you need to have that notification in Definitely. order to be able to activate, to have it open mm -hmm. and so forth, yes? So, yes. and that goes through, so someone in a vulnerable community, like mm -hmm. an ancillary, mm -hmm. if I'm at a place and I know for sure that the floods will come into my house, that's right. Do I now contact the Disaster Preparedness Committee, that chairperson, someone in that committee, yes. and they take it from there? Okay. Yes, they do. Um, in instances where the District Disaster Committee, uh, that should not be, they should be aware of everywhere our vulnerable persons are living, those with disability. And, and that is big for us at NIMO right now. We are discussing persons with disability, disability. and include them in our early warning system. So um, moving forward, we must ensure that our early warning systems are working. We have um, flood early warning systems in four communities in St. Lucia, in Ancillary, Canneries, Denry, and Masher. Um, Denry, we're trying to upgrade to a multi-hazard early warning system. And for the DVRP, we are trying to get a siren system, which will complete it, make it that multi-hazard early warning system. So. We have to ensure that all of our early warning systems include persons with disabilities, the hearing impaired, the visually impaired, um, those who can't make their own way, and so on. So we're including them in our yeah. plans. Well, post-event, looking at if the country has suffered uh, any particular damage, mm -hmm. is it mandatory that these shelters be open, or is it only activated based on the need? It is activated based on the need. Okay, so... Yeah. That's quite an interesting aspect for our viewers who are actually following this program this morning to actually know the protocols yes. as, it, as it relates to emergency shelters and what they should do mm -hmm. and that they shouldn't really try to venture out during the event, but maybe give the adequate um, notice that they'll be looking for the shelter mm -hmm. and how they proceed following the event. Well, Ms. Gustav, it's really been a great pleasure having you this morning. We, we know that your office remains very vigilant in, right. at this particular point in time and we are happy that you're able to make some time to be able this morning to at least enlighten the solution public as to their own responsibility how they can respond when these advisories are given and how they need to follow whenever the country is in any imminent danger mm -hmm. of an event that nature provides us with and we're happy that you're able to be with us this morning thanks once more for being in focus this morning. It was my pleasure and thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And we'll take our first break on our program this morning, but we'll be back in just a moment. Bon la mer, c'est un bon place pour nous un bon temps, mais c'est faux qu'on ait si un tsunami. Sous bon la mer, qu'on sente une terre qui a fondé un pile. B.C. Pouvez pas ou, et espérer de s'amener une terre de bout, et pour y mouter plus ou. So well America which he lay can a kitel mas la vitma. Pui mute plio! So tam la America fair all days old. Pui mute plio! So when nepoxy sin sala, kui mute plio coca juen mon, ebe troisième etage en kai, ek espere les autorités annonce sa descend. Kui, kui, kui mute plio! Apon les sin tsunami. La pepane a setan pou annonce a tsunami ka apoche. 
C'est une commission par groupe management des arts bien fort et classe management des arts en Saint-Lucie. Et financé par l'Agence pour le développement international Amérique, Bureau Assistance des Arts l'autre pays. The world's climate is changing and that affects all of us. Storms are becoming increasingly intense. Periods of intense drought and heavy rain stress farm animals and destroy our crops. Higher average ocean temperatures kill our coral reefs and change the migratory patterns of fish. St. Lucia contributes only 0.0015% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but is doing its part, along with countries around the world, to reduce the emissions that are warming our world and changing our climate. These efforts are called mitigation. But decades of emissions have already changed the climate, and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today will increase average global temperatures even more. We need to adapt, that is, do everything we can to prepare for and respond to the actual and expected negative effects of climate change and everyone has a role to play. We need to protect our crops, build homes that withstand storms and keep our drains and waterways free of garbage to help us recover or bounce back from climatic events. Learn more about the Government of St. Lucia's National Adaptation Plan and the steps you can take to protect yourself and your fellow St. Lucians. Préparation et prenez nos quatre chaînes manger méritées à chaque proportion, particulièrement après un désastre. Millions de conseils qui peuvent empêcher ou joindre maladie. Faites attention au cas de manger. Examinez bien pour voir si vous mangez et gardez pour date où méritez pas servir encore. Le cas de viande à la main bouchée, gardez pour ce temps bio libérément. Amenez santé qui peut mouiller ou qui viande salade et examiné et est satisfait pour vendre. Pas de viande, poisson, viande poule et bien l'autre manger qui méritez rester à souffrir du pour plus qu'il. Quatre litres de eau et bien au machin nous. Lavez la main bien et puis savon et glo tiède avant et dix mois tôt ou quand entamé viande qui pour tout de suite. Servez mon sur planche et l'autre bagaille à part pour couper viande qui pas tout de suite. Mettez les temps manger tout de suite en fridge la même après vous servir et pas tenir les pour plus qui dé pour trois jours et les ou qu'à vivre chauffer fait à six et il chauffe pile. Changer manger propre car un peu chez maladie ouais pour caution. Si vous voulez plus d'informations, cuyez bio information santé à numéro 468 secteur 49. Thanks for staying in focus. We are keeping it very sharp today. And Lisa is going to introduce our next guest. It's always a pleasure for me to do that. Uh, Dr. Gail Regobert is someone that I have absolute, absolute admiration <laughs> for, apart from the fact that she taught me. I uh, <laughs> learned a lot from her. Uh, she's one of the individuals that I think formidable women in St. Lucia. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing, that you're putting in, because I know every time I see you, I always something to talk about what's happening in the ministry you may be off to some meeting somewhere <laughs> but the focal point is always for the further development of our education sector the minister with responsibility for education innovation and we'll talk about that <laughs> quite a bit today innovation gender relations and sustainable development we are very much um, the eve of the opening of the new academic year and i know this is always a time uh, that perhaps not just busy, but even worrying for the ministry and for yourself. Mm -hmm. So much to do. And let's go to the heart of where we need to be, schools, the school plans. Mm -hmm. I know that monies were set aside. We're looking at a $10 million investment in getting schools upgraded. Mm -hmm. But each year it would seem that it becomes a little bit more difficult and to even meet what those needs are and to do it in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of where we at this year with the preparedness of our schools for the opening of the classrooms on Monday. Uh, uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you two this morning. And thank you for your very gracious comments. <laughs> very true. It is indeed the eve of the opening of school. And uh, admittedly, that comes with some anxiety because there is so much to be done. 
Whereas we have received uh, for the second year now uh, $10 million for capital works or school rehabilitation, we must never forget that although that represents a more than nine or roughly a nine million dollar increase from what the sector was accustomed to or had received previously, it still represents a mere quarter of what is required to bring all schools up to some uh, decent, habitable, aesthetically pleasing level. And so sometimes you feel like a hamster on a treadmill that you're, you're exerting a lot of effort, doing a lot, but it amounts to just so little because there is still so much to be done precisely because of what we inherited. I, I can tell you my first walkabout May weeks after assuming this office in June of 2016, I was gutted. I recall most vividly my visit to South Lewis Community College, for example, and being treated with visible evidence of what mold and mildew can do and uh, what uh, physical deterioration means uh, for the operations of a school plant. And I must say, no sooner had I reported that back to Cabinet and to our Prime Minister, he was immediately moved and compelled to make a further investment in the education sector. Understandably, it means that we have to effect a work program amounting to $10 million over uh, the fiscal year, and most of that work is done during the summer because it is the longest school break. But just that the public knows, work does continue through the Christmas and Easter breaks, for example. This year, we did a lot of work during the Easter on our uh, technical drawing labs, which were converted to smart classrooms because the CXC syllabus um, with respect to technical drawing had now gone digital. So it became necessary for us to execute that work during the Easter break. And that kind of intervention continues through uh, the calendar and fiscal year, or throughout the calendar and fiscal year, because there are other classrooms that require that ongoing attention. We have remained true to ensuring that no child will be left behind. And whereas the issue regarding the de deplorable condition of schools and the kind of work that is necessary to rehabilitate schools would often make the news, I really want for us to focus on the comprehensive and holistic intervention that we've been making in the education sector. It is all well and good for us to have very comfortable buildings. But equally, we recognize the need for continuous training and development of our teachers or educators. Mm -hmm. I must say, it pleased me greatly a couple of weeks ago to wish the cohort of students who are embarking on various levels of studies to wish them well. And, and it, it, for me, it meant that we were breathing true meaning into promises that had been made, but more importantly, answering to the needs of the sector. And you will, you will have noticed, or you would have noticed, that there, among those heading out to study, are persons specializing in curriculum development. We've heard so much about the need to revamp the curriculum. Well, we need architects, people who are schooled and skilled in curriculum development and revamping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was happy to note that th there are people who are pursuing this. Similarly, uh, teachers who deal with exceptional learners. We have often lamented that our education system appears to cater for the fat middle. So just the normal, easygoing child. If you are- read and understand, do comprehension, take the test. Exactly, and, and pass. And score high, right. yes. But what if you are superlatively talented? 
what if you are deemed to have a learning challenge? Or what if you are autistic but very skilled? And, and our focus on exceptional learners, therefore, is critical. Because increasingly, thanks to our own social evolution as a people, we recognize it is not that they're troublesome or ill-mannered or have a problem. We are responsible for catering for those students as well, notwithstanding their, their challenge, be it physical or some other emotional or behavioral condition. So that means a lot to us. So there's the physical plant, there's the training and education of our teachers ongoing, might I add, and I, I want to applaud the team that has championed the Summer Institute. We have for two consecutive summers now trained hundreds of teachers and principals in various areas. I, I recall that last year the theme was really change in mindsets, which is very important. Uh, this immediate past summer, uh, there was some focus on positive discipline intervention, which you know was quite topical. Uh, things like engaging with, with social media or, or public relations and marketing, because too very often our, our schools are thrust into the spotlight either at common entrance or when something not so savory happens. And so we, ha we are positioning them to be better able to tell their good news, whether it be sports, creative arts, just the, the very extraordinary things that schools do and we just don't know. So the training covers a whole host of areas and every summer we will focus on different areas. The ongoing training of teachers with respect to ICT integration. So you will recall all of the hullabaloo about the laptop program and the United Workers Party, this administration has remained adamant and true to its word that to equip a student with the technological artifact, the tool is grossly insufficient, that we were we felt compelled and we feel very strongly that students and teachers have to be better equipped to maximize that which the tool can do. And to do that, therefore, we have introduced a couple courses that are geared towards enhancing the digital competency of students so that they can maximize, they can leverage the use of the tool, which is the laptop, computer, or smart device in their hand. But some would argue they do not have it. If they do not personally possess one, how then can they maximize the opportunity? That is why on the back end, we have collaborated with the Taiwanese and with the OAS, the OAS program is called the Profitura program, and the Taiwanese is ICT in education program. Uh, that both programs are geared towards creating more smart classrooms. So we will not limit access to one form, one grade or class. The intention is for the entire school over time to have access to equipment. And, and that's the difference in approach, that we recognize why give it to a particular form and disadvantage the others. Is it that the younger ones have no use for that kind of equipment? Is that the, uh, the older ones, you wait till you hit the job market to buy your own? So as part of our virtual education initiative, or e-education drive, the intention is to ensure that more classrooms in more schools have uh, computers or laptops so that more students can access those tools. Uh, the, the goal is really to ensure over time that we can boast that every classroom in San Jose is a smart classroom. That will not happen overnight and that is why I'm especially grateful to the um, OAS for their partnership on the Pro Futuro program. We have in the pilot about five or six schools in the first instance. Similarly, the ICT in Education Initiative with the Taiwanese, several other schools will benefit 
thanks to the Commonwealth of Learning and the Global Partnership for Education and the OAS as well. We will continue to train teachers because it's almost as if the teachers are trying to keep up with the students yeah. nowadays yes. <laughs> because the students can navigate the technology very comfortably, mm -hmm. especially for recreational purposes. And that's the other distinction we can make. We say very, um, very casually, oh, all the children can use the technology. But it's to do it's what with and it, how do they it. use it. I can say to you, we are in the final days of, of a summer camp that I hosted in Miku North. And whereas it is largely true that uh, children can interact with the technology for recreational purposes, that skill is not there for productive mm -hmm. purposes. And, and therefore, we are very clear about the need for an intervention and to not sim simply assume that they know how to use it. You don't just do basic research. You give them a project <laughs> on how to do the research, how to filter the information, what are you getting, how do you determine what is factual, what is not. So You're yes. absolutely yes. correct. So if you think of it as an ecosystem, so we have plant, physical plant rehabilitation, we have teacher training and professional development. We've got the e-education initiative that is three-pronged. One is that teachers are schooled or trained to better integrate ICTs in the delivery of their program. Two, that we create more hardware in school. And thirdly, that you expand bandwidth or Wi-Fi access. So all of these come together very beautifully to, to, to really um, prop up our e-education initiative in schools. But as that program is being developed, how decentralized is it? I know it's just a few schools that are there, but it's important That's to That's a very good so question. That, yes, as a very good southerner, I always emphasize decentralization. <laughs> so we ensure that there's good geographic spread, that we, we always endeavor to have a school or two on the West Coast, in the South, on the East Coast, and in the North. We are very, very mindful of that. And also, we are very mindful to involve different age groups. What we have going on as well with respect to our e-education initiative is increased activity and, and teaching with respect to robotics, artificial intelligence, and, and that, that suite of, of endeavors or subject areas. Why I am so excited about this, and I really want to thank USAID for partnering with us uh, in the first pilot, which will be expanded this time around, is that we were deliberate in choosing schools uh, that we would not think of ordinarily as our top performing schools. And what has been very telling through this pilot or this experiment is that when kids find something they like, when they find their thing, they excel at it. So you have schools like the Grand Riviere School and the Boca School just shining brightly in that arena, just taking charge of this robotics thing and, and going with it. And, and the level of interest, you'd be surprised, apart from the manifest function, which is to learn how to code and to do the robotics, et cetera, the latent gains include increased attendance. Mm -hmm. So students who perhaps would have been inclined to stay home because they're not so interested in our fantastic universal one-size-fits-all curriculum, they now have something they're excited, excited about, about and that can lure them to the school. And in each of our pilot schools, the teachers and coaches have reported that not only do students come to school earlier, they stay on longer as well because they found, their, they found their thing and something that interests them. So we're doing that as well, and I want to thank USAID for, for their partnership in that area. We are also uh, retrofitting some classrooms. You notice that I referenced the technical drawing labs. That was of necessity, again, to meet the emerging demands of that curriculum and the changes in that curriculum, but we will be doing so in other classrooms as well. You, you notice 
all of these things happening in tandem is, is what is creating the turnaround in the sector. I, you know, I could almost physically feel things turning around, we're turning the corner. It, it took a lot of tweaking in various areas, but it's, it's becoming, it's, it's really coming together beautifully. So what of your stakeholders, the teachers, uh, engaging the principals and um, other administrative staff because turning that corner requires that buy-in from all of these You're so agencies. right. And parents as well. Let's yes. not forget them from that equation. So how have you been able to engender that sort of partnership? Yes. I, I mean no harm, insult or injury um, by making the reference I'm about to. I remember one of my early meetings with the principals when I spoke of e-education and that being a top priority of this minister and this administration, we were in the finance building just across the street. And when I had pronounced on it and spoken about how important it was, you could hear the silence in the room. And I literally had to say, you can breathe now, it's going to be okay. I'm not just coming here with an e-education agenda and will leave you alone and having to fend for yourselves and swim through the angry technological waters now. We will ensure that we put things in place that you receive the requisite training, that we get the hardware, the equipment, etc. And I can say um, three years on, when I look at the number of, of teachers who've been trained, who are embracing the technology, who are infusing the technology in their classrooms, I'm encouraged by this. Admittedly, I wish it could, be, it could ha happen quicker. Um, I, I referenced the CASIP project, which is critical to expanding bandwidth in, in schools. And I wish it had happened at the pace that I wanted it to, but we've had some incremental, uh, positive movement. And, and so it's not so scary anymore because on that day I remember saying to them, we're going to marry personalities from the old paradigm with the new paradigm. So it, technology may not be your thing, but do not allow your technophobia to retard the entire school or to impact negatively on the development of the children are responsible for. Partner with a teacher who's more au courant with it, who's more comfortable with it. And, and then everybody can benefit, you know. I, I often believe, you know, when the tide rises, all ships rise. So let us not be held hostage by our technophobia, but rather it, confess to it. Mm -hmm. And, and that helps as well. You can confess to it and say, well, it's not my thing, but I'd love for my students to be exposed to it. Can I partner with another teacher? In some schools, there is an IT teacher, but I want to be very clear. The infusion of ICTs in education is not limited to taking an IT course. It is that the technology undergirds all of the activity around learning and teaching. And, and that, that's the ambition. And that, therefore, is very true to a promise that we made in our manifesto, very true to what is contained within our own strategic uh, plan uh, in the ministry as well, which expires very shortly. So we will be lobbying development partners to finance the, the, the new strategic plan for, for the ministry. Now, even as you move into what developing the smart classrooms, the e-education, we are still having uh, the situation where students are moving through the system and their reading and writing ability, it is way below what is expected. I think just after um, the uh, CXC's comment, some people were complaining that the, you know, their students, when you look at the, the work, mm -hmm. it's like they are at the infancy mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. how do we begin to, how are you addressing that situation that we're not just simply pushing mm -hmm. students through the system just because they have to go through the system? I'm, I'm happy you raised this. And I often say to my colleagues, if, if you're suffering from particular ailments and you go to the doctor and hide your symptoms or lie about your symptoms, inevitably the prescription will be off. 
So we have to be true about the shortcomings in the, in the sector and to be more proactive to either avert or cure those shortcomings. With respect to those students who are not at the level expected um, throughout their progression in the system, you will recall that we have the minimum standard exam or test at grades two and four, for mm -hmm. example. And these are meant to be diagnostic tests. Uh, the jury is still out there um, trying to determine the extent to which uh, the MST has lived true to the intention of its architects, to the extent that it has become another exam. And not all schools do the diagnostic assessment and or uh, analysis rather, uh, and therefore are not well positioned to do the intervention or remedial work required. The jury is still out on that. Some schools do it very well, others need you know, to benefit from some chaperoning to get it right. However, you are correct to the extent that there are students who move through the system and still suffer um, some kind of literacy or numeracy handicap. What we have done, I'd like to emphasize what we're doing. So we recognize that. Therefore, at the secondary school level, as part of our special education program, some secondary schools have mastered the art of catering for those students. Let us not get into the debate about how did they, how did they come this far not knowing or not having those skills. Instead, let us applaud those secondary schools that cater for those students and try to bring them up to that competency level that is expected at their given age. Moreover, this year we're doing something new and that is we've partnered with CARE to embrace some of the students who did not perform at the expected level at the common entrance exam. And we are uh, subsidizing these students' attendance at CARE because you know, CARE is a private institution and there is a tuition fee. So I really want to thank CARE, Dr. Mason and her team for that collaboration. It is a pilot, let's see how it works. It is also voluntary, so parents had to agree that instead of just passing their students on to the secondary mm -hmm. school and maybe mm -hmm. getting lost in there for another five years, uh, that they would instead channel their students or children through the care program, which, which is you know, more interactive, more one-on-one, -on -one, and does have a very well-tailored program for those kinds of students. And, and I pray that that experiment works really, really well. We are, in terms of what we're doing, to correct the literacy and numeracy challenge, recognizing the perennial problem we have with mathematics. Mm -hmm. Beginning this academic year, we have what we call a, a numeracy hour. So what we've done over the summer is to engage the top mathematics teachers on island to put together a very good program of intervention or remedial intervention and students who believe that they are weak in mathematics will um, be exposed to that particular kind of delivery of the subject so as to enhance their competency in mathematics long before they write the CXE exam. Again, that's a very tangible material intervention on our part, and I really want to thank the, the mathematics teachers and coaches who have voluntarily participated in the program in terms of writing the curriculum, the lesson plans, and that will be leveraged across the country. Because the question always has been, why is it some teachers, schools, or classes do so well in particular subjects and other schools or classes not so well. So we've taken the best minds from around the country on the subject matter, the best techniques, and we've packaged those and we're going to leverage those around the country. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we just time <laughs> for our, our next break on our program. We'll be back with the Minister, Dr. Gail Regabert. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Life is in you. 
the gift of life is in me A red and rich supply for life That flows and helps us to survive Without it I am dying You share it I am living Without it I am dying You share it I am living on you I am dependent, don't let me down A pint from you I'm needing to turn my life around So come along, donate, donate, don't wait My heart is beating Say Thanks for staying in focus. We are back on our program and we will continue. Dr. Rigobert, something that's really a novelty for St. Lucians and I'm sure a lot of the sports people are very, very eager to see what will happen with the St. Lucia Sports Academy. You know, recently the president of FIFA actually came to St. Lucia and one of his stops was at the academy because FIFA has some involvement in it. Tell us a, a bit more about it. What can St. Lucians expect? What's the concept behind the Sports Academy? Thank you, Ryan. I know that one is very close to your heart. So Definitely. <laughs> there's, no, there's no surprise that you're inquiring and thanks for the opportunity to speak about it. You and I, for a long time, have heard the lamentations that the, the universal curriculum delivered at the secondary school does not cater for students who are uh, skilled in sports or creative arts or have some other kind of proclivity or interest. And uh, therefore, in assuming office, one of the things we were very, very adamant about is that what more can we do to allow multiple alternative pathways uh, for professional development for students who don't want to become accountants, nurses, doctors, teachers? <laughs> what more can we offer? And also, we have had a very good stint as a country with respect to the performance of our athletes on the international stage. So sports has been very, very topical. Every month there's a good news story yes. regarding the performance of our young people on the international stage and in some cases on the regional stage as well. It made perfect sense, therefore, that within the context of curriculum review, within the context of offering uh, specializations, that we consider what we call centers of excellence. Prior to my assuming this office, I would have heard, for example, of the Grand Riviere Secondary School being earmarked to become a center of excellence for agriculture, partly because of its proximity to the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College farm, also being in the heart of one of our major farming belts, so to speak. And we thought, and what other centers of excellence could we contemplate? Naturally, sports was one of them, and the other was creative arts and industry. I don't have to rehash the kind of talent we have uh, resident in the creative sector. With respect to sports, that ambition dovetailed beautifully with a prime minister and this administration's um, a vision to reshape, to refocus, and reposition the sporting sector in total. And that holistic ambition um, went beyond rehabilitating fields, um, goes beyond building new sporting facilities, but very importantly, um, includes pro providing professional training for our young athletes. And that is where we came in as the Ministry of Education. We recognize whatever your sport and interest, you must develop some kind of core competency in English, mathematics, maybe some science subjects, um, public speaking, <laughs> etc. And, and 
it was over two years ago, I think now, time seems to go by so quickly. Maybe a little under two years ago, we held the first consultation at the Grosley Secondary School. Why the Grosley Secondary School? One, its proximity to other sporting facilities, the Darren Sammy Grounds, the, the, the Table Tennis or Tennis Center, the Aquatic Center. But also, Grosley had additional benefits, uh, which include that the, the compound still had a lot of unused land and therefore expansion for dormitories, gym, kitchens, etc. The space was there. And the school itself had demonstrated a keen interest in the sporting development of its own students. The school benefits from strong leadership in the person of Mrs. Charles and her team. So all these variables lend themselves to Grosley being the school of choice for the, the Center of Excellence for Sports, now the St. Lucia Sports Academy. I can tell you, when we had that first consultation, we were blessed to have people like Ulja, Latapi, uh, Brian Lara, and other distinguished sporting personalities, both from here and the region in the audience and at the head table and the excitement with which the audience stakeholders greeted this announcement. I can say to you there was an equal amount of skepticism. How do you do this? And that's always the question when something is new and paradigmatic and, and, and when you're about to orchestrate a paradigmatic shift. People don't readily uh, understand or they can't readily imagine how you do this and even in-house or oh, what about the curriculum what kinds of students will go there who would want to send uh, their student to to a sports academy I can tell you I come from a family where where sports you know has has meant something to us uh, my uncle Marshall Francis one of was one of St. Lucia's early um, well-known cricketers my brother Walt who was a national footballer um, I'll not mention my name because I was stopped very very early on and that tells the story so I remember when Uncle Williams, that's, that's um, Gregor Williams, Uncle Castro, um, said, oh, you know, I have great sporting ability. My father's immediate retort is he does not know anybody who makes a living off of running. I was a long distance runner. At least I had that potential. And, and my brother, by the time he'd gone to, to England to try out, although he had a few good gigs, he was already too old. And, and so th this is personal as, as, as much as it's also um, professionally, um, the professionally wise thing to do. Can we now in 2019, two and three decades on, say to parents that if you do have a child who has some sporting potential, who has that sporting dream, that they don't have to wait to graduate from secondary school, by which time the bone's a little harder, by which time, you know, the, 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 the international competitors would have benefited from very professional training and exposure. Very early on. From very early on, you look at the sporting academies in the UK, mm -hmm. there's students from five and six going to football academies. You know, I see a similar thing happening here, thank goodness, that many of the young kids at least have that option on the weekend. So the thinking was, can we afford the students very early on that dual path of development, that the academic is not compromised, that's not the intention, that you can develop a competency in those core subjects that we need to survive anyway, while pursuing that professional sporting path. Mm -hmm. That would do three things for you. Not only would you be able to hone that sporting talent, to harness that sporting talent, uh, two, it would better position you to participate in regional and international competitions with a very good chance of emerging um, victorious. But thirdly, to give you that, that dual path post-secondary to secure scholarship for tertiary education mm -hmm. while pursuing mm -hmm. um, your professional uh, sporting discipline. Mm -hmm. 
I think coming on with that as well, I think one of the major questions that the public is asking is how do you absorb the students who are currently at the Grosley Secondary or who were at the Grosley Secondary, yes. how do you absorb them within the system and how cumbersome has this become on the ministry to actually do that? And selecting the new ones. Mm. I can say to you that because of the level of engagement and consultation that we had of stakeholders, a lot of this has been voluntary. We've not thrust this down anyone's throat. And I say that especially with respect to those students who've opted to participate in the program as that first cohort. I mean, that's, that's, that signals confidence in, in, in the Ministry of Education, in the Ministry of Sports, and in their respective um, sporting facilities that have encouraged them to participate. Secondly, the neighboring secondary schools willingly embraced those students who said, well, I'm quite happy to give up my space for somebody who really does want to pursue a sporting career and uh, to join a neighboring secondary school. The principals, the district education officer, that was so seamless that students volunteered to, to attend another secondary school and so we have students who would have attended grossly now being absorbed in secondary schools nearby. The other thing is the teachers themselves as stakeholders had a very critical role to play especially in terms of curriculum development but also very early on in saying what the challenges were likely to, to encounter and what we can do to avert or circumvent those even before we get to that bridge. And that's the level of stakeholder engagement. I recall walking into a stakeholder meeting with, with sports journalists as, as a very um, uh, select group of, of stakeholders who are coming to the initiative from a different angle. And, and even in the, in the curriculum, as I perused it as recently as last evening, uh, there is an accommodation for interviewing skills, um, commentating, and it's just so encouraging. Of course, we have the menu of courses, and over time, we'll be able to deliver those as we get the facilitators and as the students move on in the system. Physiotherapy, of course, we will have English and maths on there as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it's an exciting menu of courses, and I know that the young um, sports uh, men and women who have opted uh, to participate in this program and to be that 2019-2020 class, you will never regret this move. And I'm really excited. We've had several meetings with parents. Uh, we've met with other stakeholders. And, and I know the excitement is high. Admittedly, with respect to uh, the infrastructure, especially the new buildings, these will not be completed in time for the opening of school. Prime Minister and I did a site visit last Friday and, and the groundworks are happening, foundations, etc. But in the interim, because of the kind of, of square footage of floor space that we have at the current plant, what used to be grossly secondary school, we can uh, um, make the adjustments and accommodate the students relatively comfortably. Yes, I'm glad you closed off on that because we want to look at other areas mm -hmm. uh, on, on your your stewardship that um, we would like to get out on this program before <laughs> before we close. And we also want to allow you some time to probably answer a couple calls from, from oh, members of, of the public. <laughs> and remind you that you can call us on 468-2162. Lisa, and certainly we're hoping that we can probably maybe just um, get an additional five to 10 minutes on the program to Try allow to us to- An to additional five to yes, 10 minutes. minutes for so the ministers we can exhaust our topics this morning. We can never <laughs> exhaust all of it, <laughs> but we will try. Uh, <laughs> South Louis Community College, we spoke briefly about it in our yes. opening, but it, and you indicated that it, it, it's, it is a, a it's deep. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very deep. But I think for, for the community college, what everyone wants to know is, is will it ever be able to get to that university status? Is that something we've given up on? Mm -hmm. Given all of the problematic areas that it's going through right now, 
or is that plan still in motion? Okay, thanks for that question. Allow me to confess a, a personal bias. I have always felt that whereas attaining university status um, can and does remain an ambition, in the first instance, the Arthur Lewis College has to be the best college that it can be, in the first instance. And uh, I think it does have all of the ingredients to be poised or to be positioned as a very good uh, community college. There are some challenges in no particular order. We've had a leadership problem where the po position of, of principal has remained vacant for a while and Dr. Auguste has um, held the fort during that time and I thank her for that. I am advised by the board that in very short order we will be in a position to announce a new principal. I think the interviews have happened. The other issue at Sir Arthur Lewis is the ailing plant. Many of these buildings, historical buildings as they are, have deteriorated to the point that they are uninhabitable. Thanks to the DVRP, thanks to our EQUIP project with the CDB, we have been able to make some intervention thanks to an extra budgetary allocation of three million dollars last year we have been able to renovate one or two of the buildings as well you will notice that the nursing department a couple months ago was able to move into a new home on the morn but more importantly, what I have encouraged stakeholders to do and the Sir Arthur Lewis family to do is to take a deep dive, take a hard look at what I think is the Sir Arthur Lewis problematic. It is institutional. It is cultural. It is about physical infrastructure. It is about the status of their teachers slash lecturers. It is about leadership. It is about continuing relevance. It is about repositioning Sir Arthur Lewis such that it can remain the college of choice. Uh, and to do that, it means that it has to continue to offer to the public, to the citizens of this country, courses that are in demand, um, courses that speak to the needs of the labor market, not only today's labor market, but what the labor market will look like tomorrow as well. In, in that regard, therefore, we've had some very intense discussions at the board level, and I imagine that those conversations also trickle down at other levels, is um, we've had intense conversations about the necessity to clean up the curriculum, that obviously there are courses on there that do not attract the same level of interest as others. And similarly, there are courses that are in demand that aren't yet on South Lewis's books. And I want to applaud them for being open to the exercise of discarding some, putting some on hold for a while, but also introducing new courses. In that regard, the work they have done with multimedia, for example, what they're doing with their pastry uh, and baking program, what they're doing with um, La Fort, their, their working restaurant, if I call it that, where their students run that restaurant. You must go up there to have a meal. It is well worth it. Good value for money and great service by the students. What they have done recently in partnership with the OAS in terms of training um, the mechanics from the, the fire service, I think it was, and what they've done for Lucilec in terms of upgrading and, and, and licensure, because you know these things, things change. And so you have to be au courant of the new techniques of doing things. So the Arthur Lewis problematic is, is, is deep. It's multifaceted. Let me say that cabinet holds, holds Sir Arthur Lewis close to its heart. And that is why we've already received the nod to engage the Caribbean Development Bank to put together a special envelope 
for Sir Arthur Lewis so that we can, in the same manner that the problem is multifaceted, that we can finance a multifaceted intervention. So it is about rehabilitation of buildings, training of the teachers or retraining and reschooling of the teachers, curriculum review and innovation. It is about expanding um, technological capacity. Already there are some online courses, but that is the way of the world now. That's the direction in which we're going, and we need to ensure that more can be done at Sir Arthur Lewis to offer students um, that, that dual engagement, both face-to-face -face and online. But inevitably you must have the technology and the bandwidth to do that and teachers who are themselves schooled and able to leverage the technology we also have to look at programs like the nursing program that uh, that is very much sought after what more can we do so it can be more attractive we can have more regional and international students already there are expressions of interest from uh, various parts of the world so we need to look at how how we could expand that program so we can maximize on that interest of course thinking of the revenue generation to be had as well more recently and I, I say this with a little bit of caution because I know we've not had much engagement, so I will articulate it as a vision. It's not to say we've decided we're going that way. But the vision is that given the amount of money that the government sets aside each year for the training of public servants, could we not partner with an institution like Sir Arthur Lewis that itself is cash strapped to be the agency to deliver those programs? So it's win-win for us that Sir Arthur Lewis gets to make some money, that we get to train our public servants, especially those between grades is it one and six, or, so that they can we can develop some competency or some cap some capacity at that level. So it gives them the revenue generating opportunity. We maximize the use of the 100 plus lecturers we have on there and also our public servants get an upgrade in their skill sets. So we're still brainstorming this. I don't want this to be sold as, you know, it's sealed because you know my mantra, engage, 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 consult, consult, consult. But it seems like something worth pursuing since there are so many people who stand to benefit. On the eve of the reopening of school, we know that there have been some delays. There's no running away from it. I wish I could say that all the schools are ready uh, for the reopening of school on Monday. In the schools where we did very comprehensive work, um, we may lag behind a day or two, and, and some schools may have to consider opening on Wednesday. I leave that to my technocrats to determine which ones. We still have a, at least four days to work with before Monday and a lot can happen in four days. I beg the patience and indulgence of teachers and principals. You know, the irony of this is, is when there is a complaint about the school not opening in time, that is usually a good indicator of the quantum of work that we did. <laughs> and maybe we should uh, cut back on, on some of the work programs in the summer and stagger it throughout the year. But you really want that in September, students can come to a new space, you know, brightly painted. Um, and with feel fresh. And feel, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and we continue to do our very best to ensure that that is the case. Regrettably, again, this year, one or two schools may have to be staggered in terms of the opening schedule, reopening schedule. But, but it's precisely because we were trying to do so much in that time. The rehabilitation work will continue on weekends where that is permissible and certainly during the Christmas and Easter break as is customary. But I want to thank all stakeholders for their patience and indulgence. We have a question from a Facebook viewer sure. and uh, wants to know, is the University of Glasgow, that reparation fund is, um, with UE, mm -hmm. is it available to individual states in the Caribbean? I understand it will be an agreement between Glasgow and UAE. 
Allow me to look into that. I would not want to make a dogmatic pronouncement on it because I know that there's still so much discussion regarding the mechanics or operationalization of the fund, except that I see no reason why we shouldn't benefit. Just want to remind our viewers that you can call us on 468-2162 if you have any questions for Dr. Rigobert on our program. We will be here for another 10 minutes or so, so you can call in as we speak to her on matters pertaining to the reopening of school and other areas under her portfolio. Well, Madam Minister, we know for sure that this is something that you have every year, the, this whole, the, the, the situation of the school plans. And we were happy to hear that you also do not just depend on the long summer holidays, but also for the Christmas time and also Easter. And you did mention on, on the weekends, as such, and yes. with four days still remaining before Monday. Is it something that the ministry has instituted that all during the year you, you monitor in terms of your maintenance needs so that it will ease on the pressure of these um, improvements and rehabilitation of plans when it comes to the long vacation and to start a new school year? If you allow me, let, let me say that no one in my ministry, and certainly I, I'm not comfortable with any school having to open a day or too late because of continuing infrastructural work. And last year, when we did our post-rehabilitation review, and even before that, but certainly in our post-rehabilitation review, we recognized that we would do well to have additional personnel, like a QS or a superintendent of works, for example. Believe it or not, only last week we were blessed with those two personalities. So I already know next summer that with these two additional bodies, we can cure some of the administrative hurdles and, and enjoy greater levels of efficiency because you'd be surprised what a difference those two individuals can make as, as um, additions to the team. Uh, the other thing is, I can confess too that following uh, our side visit on Friday. Like I said, Prime Minister and I visited eight schools and one library on Friday. We did make uh, adjustments, and, and, f and some of those adjustments will affect the Monday reopening of school, but we thought, you know what, you know when your heart breaks and you realize, no, this is just urgent. I don't think this can wait for another term. Let's do what we can. Um, so we had some of that as well. Uh, and uh, it's just the administration of this. It, it, it boggles the mind, uh, some of the paperwork, L loads of paperwork. And I'll, I'll have you know, we started in April, May, June. The call went out early in the year, principals reported, but it's just the administration. Um, operating within the guidelines, and gladly so, operating within the gui gui guidelines of the Finance Act, for example, ensuring that nominated contractors are suitable for the works for which they've been nominated. The contractors themselves, depending on the quantum of work they're given, have to secure the requisite finances to so do. And we're really hoping that we can cure some of those or shorten some of those administrative hurdles uh, such that we don't have another year, you know, of, of uh, a school being open a day or two or too late. We have a Facebook uh, question, mm -hmm. and it's uh, by what you've said, the um, viewer wanted to know whether the community college is not expected to transition into a university anytime soon. And if that is the case, how can we account for the funds invested in the college uh, transformation thus mm -hmm. far? I was not in the least suggesting that we would not transform into university. I began by saying that that remains an ambition, but I'm adamant that before you can become a university that you ought to be a stellar college. Um, if you think of a morphing process, it's a precursor um, growth component or stage before becoming a university. So we can sharpen ourselves as a, a sterling college and then a transition to university and will happen organically. 
On the teacher education, mm -hmm. and as you mentioned earlier, we have those 18 teachers who went off mm -hmm. uh, under the EQUIP program. What about at the teaching teachers college? Mm -hmm. So oh, are that's we a leaving very good question. behind those who are unable to secure those scholarships? Oh no, no. The the applicants or oh, the scholars who have benefited from this program um, will recruited largely from within the sector as active uh, teachers. Largely, there may be one or two exceptions. The Teachers College, which is the teacher ed department, we say casually Teachers College, I would have met with them about two years ago. And we concluded through um, some cursory analysis that we needed to undertake or undergo some kind of revamping in that department, especially as it pertains to curriculum review. and. I said, and we agreed further, that we had sufficient talent in-house to undertake the exercise of curriculum review. And that is why we had halted the intake of certain categories of student teachers to allow the lecturers additional time of or non-teaching or non-contact hours to review the curriculum and to draft or craft a new curriculum, one that is more suitable for the 21st century. I imagine that they're still working on that and uh, Dr. Felicia has promised that in time, who is the Dean of Teacher Ed, um, that he will have that done and as soon as we've done that I'd love to share it with the public because there's a lot of talent in that department and, and I was not convinced that I needed to bring in someone from the outside to do that for them. I believe that there is sufficient in-house talent to do that exercise. Some people are concerned that we may have shot ourselves in the foot by not latching on to become it is the fourth uh, UE uh, mm -hmm. campus mm -hmm. um, in the region. How do you explain to the public why St. Lucia did not seek, as Antigua did, to become that host country? I can say to you that the endeavor to become uh, a UE campus is not something that has reached my desk or that I have engaged with UE on in any detail. The reason being that it just never came up. It preceded me. Um, we've not had reason to engage on that level. There might have been passing conversations about it, but not an engaged, sustained dialogue uh, regarding St. Lucia becoming a campus. And part of the reason is that many solutions don't realize the open campus of the University of the West Indies is right here in St. Lucia on the morn. So there's a, I heard all of this quarrel about St. Lucia not having a campus and why not St. Lucia? The open campus is right there, heavily subsidized by the government of St. Lucia, heavily subscribed by St. Lucian students. So it is not a situation where St. Lucians have been starved of an opportunity. It's not a situation where um, the, this administration has not engaged UE to have another campus. Well, there is one on the moon. There is one that serves our present needs. There is one that's doing a sterling job at churning out very well qualified St. Lucians and graduates from other parts of the region as well. So it's not an inherent loss by any definition. And, and, and so I want to stem that fear. <laughs> we have not, uh, there isn't um, a gap that has been created because we've not become uh, a fourth residential campus. The open campus is right there on the moon. The open campus of the University of the West Indies is headquartered in St. Lucia and is accessible by all St. Lucians who, who matriculate or qualify for entry into its various programs. If you ask them for their registration records, you'd see the scores of hundreds of St. Lucians that have benefited from, from the product offering on the moon. 
So I hope that cures notions of, oh, we don't have a campus, oh, solutions can't get to go to UE. Further, let us not forget that Sir Arthur Lewis continues to have a relationship with the UE St. Augustine campus, whereby students of the social sciences department, in particular, can pursue the first two years of their three-year degree right here on the morn. So we have two UE product offerings on the morn. One in collaboration with Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, um, largely for students earmarked to pursue a social science degree, whereby they can do the first two years on the morn right here at home. Failing that, they also have the option of registering for any of the open campus courses available. And again, because it is so heavily subsidized by the government of St. Lucia, works out to be a lot cheaper than having to go overseas to one of the other campuses. Just before mm -hmm. we, we close off, to reiterate and to, to clarify mm -hmm. for, for our listeners and viewers, Rehabilitation of the schools, some schools may, the opening may be staggered. Can you speak to more specifics? Do we know which schools would that be? And have the parents already been notified? I will leave that to my technical staff because I know that they're spending the morning doing that analysis. Some schools were flagged yesterday. In some instances, we threw more workmen on task. In other cases, we're meeting with stakeholders. So I would not want to make that pronouncement outside of having engaged with stakeholders adequately. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Egelbert. It's thank certainly you. great to have you in focus today as we focus on the recommencement of school for the new school year, the new academic year. And we're happy that you're able to really give the public some of the plans and policies of government as it relates to the education system and how we're going forward into the new academic year. We'd also like to say thanks to Ms. Doreen Gustav, the Acting Director of NEMO, who was with us at the start of our program. I'm Rana Brown on behalf of my co-host Lisa Joseph saying goodbye.